and I um, at the, am the head of humanitarian at Oxfam Novib. I want to welcome you all to this public webinar called Forthcoming Annexation. At the moment, we have approximately 30 people online, and I still see that people are joining. So I propose that we begin, and hopefully, if people want to join, they will do so soon. This is the first of two webinars that four Dutch organizations are holding, are organizing, given the current developments in Israel and occupied Palestinian territory. These four organizations are Bux, a Dutch peace organization, SOMO, the Dutch Knowledge Center for Research on Multinational Corporations, the Rights Forum, a Dutch high-level network which promotes a just and durable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and Oxfam Novib, which is the Dutch Development and Humanitarian Organization and the Dutch affiliate of Oxfam International. I'm very, very pleased that today we have three distinguished speakers with us. First of all, we have Dr. Munir Nus Nuseiba, he is the Director of Community Action Center at Al-Quds University. Then secondly, we have Ms. Sharona Weiss, the Head of International Advocacy at the Israeli Human Rights Organization, Yasdeen. And finally, we are joined by Mr. Jamie McGoldrink. Jamie McGoldrink is the UN Deputy Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, the UN Resident Coordinator, and the Humanitarian Coordinator for the Occupied Palestinian Territory. Each of the speakers will have 15 minutes to make an intervention. Then we'll have a Q&A. So also this is an invitation to all the attendees to please submit any questions that you may have in the chat box. These will be reviewed and then shared with me so that questions can be posed to the panelists. This webinar is scheduled to end at 4.30 Netherlands time, which is 5.30 Jerusalem time. Finally, important housekeeping announcement. We are recording this webinar so that we can also share it later for those who are not able to join at this moment. Before giving the floor to Mr. Naseba, I would just like to give a few introductory remarks. That today we're talking about the pathway to toujours annexation of West Bank land. However, the forced displacement of Palestinians from their land and unchecked settler violence is not new and this has already resulted in much de facto annexation of Palestinian land. Last month, Oxfam published a report showing that even now, during the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis, we're seeing increased violence by Israeli settlers against Palestinian civilians and an accelerated effort by the government of Israel to formally annex Palestinian land in the West Bank. Of course, this is all happening in a context in which globally there is a global pandemic happening. There are other crises like the climate change crisis, rise in authoritarianism in many countries. And of course, since we have seen last week, the horrific violence due to racism in the US and of course, global solidarity movements worldwide. So this is a very, very urgent context in which the discussion today is happening. And I just wanted to situate it as such. Uh, without further ado, Munir, I would like to give you the floor and I'll go on mute myself. You have 15 minutes, please. Um, thank you very much uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak today at this event and uh, for organizing the event. I think it's very timely and very important. Uh, so I appreciate this opportunity. Um, and uh, hello to everyone who is uh, attending this uh, webinar. Um, my presentation uh, today uh, will, uh, will be about two things. First, I will give a general introduction uh, just to uh, let people know uh, what is the occupied Palestinian territory um, and therefore uh, this will lead to a general introduction about also the annexation. Uh, but secondly, I will focus a little bit uh, on Jerusalem and um, because we have had an experience uh, of annexation before, um, and um, which is Jerusalem, East Jerusalem uh, specifically. Uh, so I will be talking more about East Jerusalem and about what annexation meant, uh, leaving some elements uh, that I want uh, that are also uh, significant and important uh, to my colleague Sharona, who uh, will also speak about many important uh, um, um, issues that will. Um, probably um, that are will be raised and that will uh, be focused on uh, once uh, the annexation will happen, um, what we expect to be uh, bad experiences of uh, Palestinians and human rights, uh, potential human rights violations that will be unfortunately experienced. 
Um, so let me just share my PowerPoint here. Okay. Okay. Um, let's look good, huh? Okay. Uh, so I will start with the introduction first before I go for uh, um, some specific issues that I want to discuss uh, uh, comparing between what happened in the past in Jerusalem and what might happen in the future, in the near future, unfortunately, uh, in the areas that will be annexed uh, in, 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 in the rest of the West Bank. Uh, but let me start with the introduction. Um, uh, in, until 1947, uh, until 1948, actually, uh, uh, Palestine, which is on the map uh, that is uh, uh, in the left, uh, was all under British mandate. Uh, and uh, Britain um, was uh, um, working towards um, uh, creating a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, the native Palestinian population at the time uh, were against uh, uh, the idea, but in all cases, this question was uh, sent to the United Nations General Assembly uh, with a recommendation, and the United Nations uh, General Assembly recommended that Palestine should be partitioned into two states, one Jewish state and one uh, Arab Palestinian state, uh, according to the map that you see um, uh, in, the left, uh, um, in the left of the screen. Uh, then in, uh, a war uh, erupted as soon as this uh, uh, UN resolution um, uh, was issued. And uh, the facts uh, that, that happened after that is that Israel managed to uh, uh, get through, um, mainly through the war, uh, but also through uh, some uh, negotiations, uh, to establish itself uh, on 78% of, of Palestine, which is uh, the area in this uh, uh, bright, uh, uh, bright color. I think it's orange, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, there were two areas that were uh, not uh, uh, controlled by Israel uh, at the end of this war. Uh, this area is called the West Bank. Uh, which uh, was uh, uh, controlled and later annexed by uh, Jordan. So it became uh, actually part of Jordan until 1967. And this area is called Gaza Strip. It's an area where uh, the headquarters of uh, a Palestinian state at the time uh, was uh, uh, declared in 1948, known as the All Palestine Government and the State of Palestine. Um, but, uh, uh, but it was under Egyptian control, uh, uh, military control and administration. In 1967, Israel occupied uh, these two areas, the West Bank, uh, including East Jerusalem, which was under Jordan at the time, and Gaza Strip, as well as other lands, the Golan Heights from Syria and Sinai from Egypt. Um, and uh, as soon as this happened, uh, actually, uh, Israel uh, decided to uh, annex East Jerusalem. Uh, and what is meant here by annexation is that Israel decided to uh, consider uh, the area uh, that you can see east of the green line here uh, on the map on the right. Um, they, they decided to consider it part of Israel. Uh, all of this inside the blue line here. Uh, they considered it part of Israel. They enlarged the Jerusalem uh, municipality, the Israeli Jerusalem municipality, um, and uh, decided to apply all the Israeli law uh, in, in, in this area that uh, 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 became a greater Jerusalem. Uh, so this annexation uh, changed everything. Uh, uh, as time went by also more and more, it changed everything for the people and for uh, for the lands. Um, and I will be discussing soon some of the ways uh, how this, these things changed. Uh, but uh, also in 2003, Israel started erecting a wall. Uh, in some areas, it is a fence. In some areas, it's a concrete wall, as the one that you can see here, which is uh, a section of the wall. Uh, this picture was taking, taken while the wall was actually being built uh, in 2002. 
Um, and this wall separates two different parts of Jerusalem. Uh, one of them is an area that was actually annexed by Israel, and, uh, and the other side is an area in Jerusalem uh, that was not, not annexed by, uh, by Israel. Um, so um, what happened to the population uh, that lived in Jerusalem um, after 1967 and uh, after the annexation? And this is a question that I think is very important uh, now because it will probably give us uh, a picture uh, of uh, what probably will happen to people who live in the areas that will be annexed soon by Israel. Um, since Israel enlarged the map of, of Jerusalem towards the east, uh, 70 kilometers square in 1967, uh, it decided to give a permanent residency status to Palestinians who lived in the city. Uh, not a citizenship, a residency status. This is the type of status that uh, maybe Europeans know uh, experience in their in your countries where someone immigrates to your countries and after a certain period of time they get a residency status and then they can upgrade to, uh, to, to a citizenship if they apply. Uh, this is exactly the way uh, Israel treated uh, the Palestinians who lived in Jerusalem. They treated Palestinians as, as if they were immigrants uh, who came to Israel, although I mean it was Israel who came to them, not the other way around, but this is exactly how Israel treated them uh, as foreign nationals who live on Israeli territory. Um, and they gave them this uh, uh, residency status. They issued them uh, blue ID cards, which were uh, easily identifiable from uh, ID cards that were issued from, for the rest of the population of the West Bank, uh, who uh, had orange uh, ID cards, and then it became green later after the Palestinian Authority came. Uh, and then they also created another status for the people who lived in Gaza and issued red ID cards, which also turned green after the Palestinian Authority uh, uh, started, uh, assumed some responsibility in parts of the West Bank. Um, uh, and uh, so these two pictures, as the one on the left is the ID card, which actually changed recently. It looks diff a bit different now. And the one on the bottom is a travel document, which is uh, uh, issued for people in order to be able to travel uh, through uh, Israeli uh, exits. Um, the most important uh, 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 thing about this uh, residency status is that uh, it is uh, easily revocable. Uh, it is not like citizenship. Um, and Israel has been revoking residencies uh, from Palestinians since 1967, uh, they have revoked um, around 15,000 residency statuses uh, since uh, 1967. Um, and not only that, they also, when they introduced uh, this status, they actually took a census and whoever was not present in Jerusalem at the time was prevented from taking, uh, uh, you know, from getting this residency status. Um, but uh, the revocation is not the only problem, although it is uh, huge and it is a big fear because in order to continue uh, to enjoy this residency status, which allows you to live in your house and to work uh, in Jerusalem and to move uh, around the city, um, uh, um, you have to actually continue uh, to prove your what, what Israel calls center of life, uh, which means which means that you have to continue to prove that you actually your center of life is in the area that Israel considers part of its sovereignty. Uh, and if you have a house, let's say, in other parts of the West Bank, or if you travel, or if you live abroad for a certain period of time, then your residency status is, uh, is at risk uh, and might be uh, 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 revoked. But this is, uh, uh, but also Israel introduced new methods for residency revocation. The most recent one was called breach of allegiance. So uh, they can actually revoke your residency status, which means prevent you from your right to live in, 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 in Jerusalem. If they uh, accuse you of uh, breach of allegiance, uh, which includes actually uh, um, um, anything that they would call terrorism, uh, and incitement to terrorism and all of that, and anything that they can call treason according to the Israeli law. Um, so, uh, of course, this is a big risk for many Palestinians today. 
But the other problem that is linked to uh, this status is family unification. Uh, since Jerusalem became uh, um, not part of the West Bank anymore, um, and not part of Gaza, obviously, uh, Palestinians from the West Bank or Gaza or anywhere around the world who want to marry Palestinians from Jerusalem um, and live with them in Jerusalem need to apply for uh, family unification. Israel has severely restricted this process since 1967, uh, sorry, since uh, uh, 2003. Um, and uh, basically um, now, Palestinians who uh, are from the West Bank who want to, uh, who marry Palestinians from Jerusalem and who want to live in Jerusalem can never get a, Palestinian, a, a residency, uh, a permanent residency, and the maximum they can get is uh, a permit that needs to be uh, renewed every one year or two years. Uh, so this is keeping many Palestinians uh, all the time uh, applying for permits. Some of them accepted, some of them rejected, but then if it's accepted, you need to renew it again every uh, once in a while and to continue proving that your center of life is, is, is in Jerusalem and uh, uh, it makes their lives basically, basically uh, working with lawyers all the time uh, on a daily basis uh, to uh, uh, just to live in, uh, under one roof. Uh, another problem that is linked to uh, this uh, civil status that Israel uh, created uh, is child registration restriction. Um, Israel has introduced many restrictions uh, for Palestinians. Since Palestinians in Jerusalem are not citizens, they are only residents, uh, their children do not automatically get the residency status. It's not like citizenship. Uh, and there are many complicated restrictions for uh, registering children, and many children and their parents fail to meet uh, these expectations, which has mm, uh, left uh, thousands of children in Jerusalem unregistered uh, until, until today, uh, which means that they don't have uh, social welfare rights, they cannot get free medical care, they cannot... Uh, 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 when they grow up, they, grow, they don't have an ID card, which means they cannot work, they cannot open a bank account. It's a lot of, and they cannot travel, obviously. Uh, so it's making that child, uh, the, the life of thousands of children uh, uh, really difficult. Uh, so by uh, discussing this, uh, and now I'm approaching the end of my uh, uh, talk, uh, or my presentation. By discussing this, I was trying to anticipate that this is probably uh, the type of status that Palestinians in the uh, areas that will uh, be annexed in the West Bank will get. Probably it will be a residency status. Um, and, uh, and I am sure that Israel will create a certain criteria about who will get the status and who will not get the status. We know that there are Palestinians in the areas that we think Israel will annex, uh, where Israel does not recognize the legitimacy and the legality of, uh, of uh, the residents of these people in these areas. Are they going to be prevented from get, getting a civil status that will allow them to live there? Is Israel going to create more physical barriers in order to prevent Palestinians from access to the lands that are going to, uh, uh, to be um, um, the lands that are going to be uh, annexed? Um, uh, and then there are other laws that are in the Israeli legal system, like the absentee property law, which uh, uh, Sharona is going to talk about. Uh, but then what about the civil society organizations that are working in, uh, in the areas that are going to be annexed? If, uh, is Israel going to recognize them? Is it going to ask them to make a new registration according to the Israeli legal system? Um, is Israel going to restrict the work of Palestinian of the Palestinian Authority in the areas that are going to be annexed? This is highly expected. This is what Israel does in Jerusalem. If you conduct any event in Jerusalem and invite any official from the Palestinian Authority, the Israeli police and intelligence forces will come and close the event immediately. So there are many questions uh, about what the effect on uh, uh, civil life uh, this annexation will have. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, the effect will be severe. Uh, in addition, of course, to the uh, um, disastrous political um, uh, uh, consequences of the upcoming annexation. I think I will stop here, and uh, if there will be any questions later, I'll be happy to discuss further. Thank you, uh, Sreen.
Thank you so much, Munir, and uh, also a belated welcome to those participants who only joined halfway. Um, Munir Nuseiba from Al-Quds University just finished his presentation, and now we'll just proceed on to Sharona Weiss from Yashtin. Please, Sharona, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'll start with saying thank you to Oxfam, PAX, the Rights Forum, and so on, um, and the Israel-Palestine platform for hosting. It's an honor to speak with such experienced and knowledgeable colleagues as Dr. Munir Sebet and Mr. Danny McCodrick. Um, thank you to Munir for an excellent description and detailed background to the situation we find ourselves in, especially what we can expect when we look at what's already happened in East Jerusalem, um, which is especially significant coming from a Palestinian who's far more personally affected by these measures than, than I am. Um, I also would like to briefly give honor to victims of police violence worldwide. Um, which is also far too prevalent here, um, particularly towards Palestinians. And uh, as excuse well, me, Sharona. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes. I recognize that you are uh, having a little bit of an echo. I don't know if there's anything you can do, maybe to change your sound or anything. If not, please proceed. Um, let's see. I don't have any earphones with me. Let me see. Um, let's see. Do you hear me any better? Or? It just seemed to get a little bit better. Let's just try. I will go on mute. Please proceed. Okay. Um, I just want to give a quick honor to victims of police violence worldwide and to know that this is also a tool used particularly for Palestinians, including those under occupation, as we saw under occupation and under already annexed territory, as we saw last week of Yad in Jerusalem. Um, I will mostly be presenting on Yeshdin's most recent position paper on the human rights in of annexation, which I will send after I'm done in the chat, um, though I'd also like to give a bit of background on the issue. Do you hear me better? Is there still an echo? Or it's, is it okay? It seems somehow it still is not too great. Maybe you could okay. just speak a little bit further, um, mm -hmm. just yeah, a little bit further from the microphone, and just okay. please speak slowly, but we can hear you. Sure. Okay. So we basically were working on a position paper on the human rights implications of uh, annexation. Um, and during, in the course of working on the paper, the Israeli, um, the Israeli attempts to form a government were successful and they came up with a coalition agreement which was signed um, in, and within the coalition agreement, there was an article allowing for annexation as early as July 1st. As soon as we saw this, we urgently worked until midnight to release our position paper on the same day, knowing that this is a very critical issue and we had very limited time to push on the issue. I and mean, what else are you going to do while we're all working closed in, in our own houses? Um, soon after, we also began approaching the diplomatic community and the Israeli and international public as, um, to try to raise the issue to public discourse. Um, Approach states individually and have been doing a lot of briefings also with our colleagues at Breaking the Silence on, on the issue. Um, since the inception of the occupation, which by the way, tomorrow um, marks 53 years of prolonged occupation, um, known by Palestinians as Yom Naksa, and Israel has refused to acknowledge the Palestinian territory under occupation as occupied, um, beginning with then Israeli commander Abba Ibn. Israel would always use the term disputed territories, essentially whitewashing its responsibilities according to international law, while still assuring the world that its activities and violations of occupied territory are temporary. Um, this, uh, this term was obviously rejected by the world. However, um, the world did actually accept Israel's claims that its, its uh, activities in occupied territory were temporary. Um, there, there are many reasons to believe that Israel never intended to forfeit control of the land or domination over the Palestinian people, even from the start. However, in theory, this was the position, and the world cared essentially more about Israel's words than the intention reflected its actions. However, around 2017, this shifted dramatically. The Netanyahu government was really the first to completely retract from this position blatantly indicating that it had no wish to relinquish control of the occupied territory. Um, the prohibition on, I will note that the prohibition on annexation of lands conquered by force 
um, is connected to principles that passed after World War II based on the fundamental idea that states are prohibited by using force for exploitation only and should only be using such force for defensive aims. The international order prohibits exploitative wars. And so by allowing the, this exploitation of occupied territory, and even more so annexation, this will only incentivize um, wars of aggression and exploitation around the world, and essentially render many international principles meaningless. Against Dean, we began monitoring the situation of de facto or creeping annexation several years ago. One of our first in-depth reports on the matter was from Occupation to Annexation in 2016, in which we examined the silent adoption of the recommendations given in the Levy Committee's report. The Levy Committee was appointed in 2012 to advise the Netanyahu government in solving the dilemma posed by many so-called unauthorized outposts in the West Bank. The committee conclusion was to release a report essentially stating that the laws of belligerent occupation and the Fourth Geneva Convention are not applicable and set forth a number of ways for retroactively authorizing most illegal Jewish construction in the West Bank. Note that I say Jewish, it did not leave any room for um, retroactively authorizing any Palestinian construction. I won't go into all of the details, but our report revealed that in the years after the committee's recommendations were presented, the government was silently implementing many of these measures while also telling the world that it was still striving for a two-state solution, that its activities were temporary. However, in the years following this report, the government ceased even claiming its efforts were temporary, and in 2017, the regularization or expropriation bill passed, allowing for the retroactive authorization of nearly all unauthorized outposts and the expropriation of significant amounts of Palestinian land. There is a petition by a number of human rights organizations, including Yeshdin, as well as Palestinian landowners, that's currently challenging this piece of legislation. Um, the, the proceedings are still ongoing. No decision has been made since. Um, the government also began speaking openly of annexation in this, in this period, together with US support. For instance, during Israel's 20th visit, 60 measures were introduced eight of which passed, indicating some application of Israeli sovereignty in the West Bank, suggesting already existing de jure annexation. Um, we have a database of these, these measures and in which we're continuing to, to, uh, man like to uh, examine any additional measures that are being taken that suggest de jure annexation. So I can also send the link for that. Um, in April, as mentioned earlier, we released the, the position paper on the human rights implications that annexation would have, which I'll spend the rest of my presentation discussing. Um, this, we, this annexation and the human rights implications, we examine not only on those living within annexed territory, which actually might only be a small percentage of Palestinians, but also those living in other areas of the West Bank present several direct violations of Palestinian human rights that will likely occur, as well as international implications, changes in governmental powers, and the entrenchment of an apartheid or apartheid-like system in the West Bank. First of all, um, the direct violations that we expect would be inherent, which Munir also mentioned in, some, in short in his presentation, and which some of which we see in East Jerusalem as well. Um, first of all, we start with freedom of movement. There would likely be a significant increase in road blockages, lack of access to roads, whose construction would likely advance while Palestinians would be denied any access to main arteries and be required to take significant detours on underdeveloped roads to avoid these Jewish only roads. This is a situation which already exists but would likely accelerate significantly under annexation. We also are very concerned about Palestinians' ability to enter and exit the West Bank, especially if the Jordan Valley is annexed, um, because most of the entry and exit points for Palestinians to leave the West Bank are in the Jordan Valley corridor. Um, we also note that property rights would be significantly harmed amidst what likely would be unprecedented rapid settlement expansion. We'd likely see, um, with Israel's declaration of sovereignty, We'd see that governmental powers would be transferred to local settlement authorities who would essentially have motivation to hear 
to rapidly develop settlements while denying Palestinians the ability to, to, to develop. This development would, of settlements would also be accompanied by significant amounts of land expropriation, um, while other plots would require coordination. As Munir mentioned, a likely way that this would be done would be to use the absentee properties law of 1950, which was used to transfer Palestinian land to Israel during the following the 1948 war, um, which stipulates that property owned by a citizen or resident of an enemy state or a person in mandatory Palestine, but not in sovereign Israel, could be transferred to the custodian of absentee's property. This is especially significant since most land owned in Area C belongs to Palestinians living in Area B. Um, this could lead to the expropriation of thousands of imams of Palestinian land and harm significant sources of income for Palestinians in both areas B and C. And even if the land is not expropriated, many, many Palestinians in area B would have to gain permits to access Israeli territory that's under Israeli sovereignty. Permits that we already know are arbitrarily given and taken at will and are often only given for a few days a year. During those few days, from our experience um, with, for instance, the olive harvest, Palestinians often also encounter significant violence at the hands of Israeli settlers. Um, in addition, as I, said, in, as I said before, settlement expansion would impede um, Palestinian development, restricting Palestinian cities and villages from being able to expand um, and not being prioritized by the local authorities, which would be further power by the Israeli government. Um, in addition, there would be a lot, very significant likelihood of demolitions and expulsions of communities not recognized by Israel, such as herding communities and Bedouin, like in Khan al-Ahmar. Um, just yesterday, we witnessed a significant number of demolitions carried out in the Jordan Valley and in communities in the South Hebron Hills. Um, this could be in preparation for annexation plans, though we really can't say for certain. However, already the civil administration refuses to recognize many such communities, and even those who have been in existence for decades, preferring to register their residents instead as residents of nearby Palestinian cities, such as in the South Hebron Hills, many residents of villages are not allowed to actually register as residents of their village. It instead, it's, they're registered as residents of Yatta, um, a nearby city. This will set the stage for forcible transfer of significant number of Palestinians. Um, furthermore, the, we expect further control over natural resources, efforts to exploit and deplete, especially water, leaving Palestinians with even fewer natural resources than they already have, creating um, a situation where Palestinians have much, much further less control over their own natural resources, while Israelis enjoy and deplete an increased amount. Lastly, the question remains what the status of Palestinians in annexed areas after such expulsions would be, as Munir mentioned. We, we can guess that there won't be many Palestinians actually present in the annexed areas, both based on the Trump plan, as well as um, comments by, by Israeli authorities. But those who remain would likely be similar to East Jerusalem Palestinians, um, where the vast majority of those who even apply for citizenship are rejected, even though most Palestinians prefer not to apply. And it, according to Netanyahu's statements made by Netanyahu last week, um, it doesn't seem that any, any chance of citizenship will be given. Um, he stated last week in an interview that if they annex the Jordan Valley, that Palestinians in the Jordan Valley would not be given um, citizenship. Um, with all of this said, we can see that this is leading to a situation in which Israel, and already is a situation in which Israel is pushing Palestinians into less and less space with essentially no ability to develop and nearly no access to their own resources and no civil rights, while Israelis enjoy um, increased access to resources, expanding settlements, and full civil rights. A very dangerous situation, um, both locally and for the international order, and one which does um, does actually, we assert, um, constitute uh, the crime of apartheid.
Um, this also undercuts many principles of international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and international criminal law. It also brings, lastly, it brings into question the, how the, the principle of differentiation can be applied. How can third states apply this if annexation takes place? If it becomes impossible, then, then what options are there going to be for European communities to, to actually um, not recognize Israeli settlements and occupied territory? Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that intervention, Sharona. Thank you again. Great. Uh, now we go to Jamie McGoldrink as our third speaker. Please, Jamie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Suing, and thanks to Munir and Sharona. I think they laid out the ground very, very clearly in two different ways. I'll, I will speak basically on two elements, one on the humanitarian situation, one on the political. I'll reflect, some of the stuff that Munir mentioned, I'll, I'll just expand upon that. But I would also say for a couple of things in the outset, I would say that uh, annexation has already started. I mean, it's, it's creeping annexation. What we're talking about now is an acceleration of that, whenever that takes place. I mean, from the, the UN's point of view, I mean, our, our position is very, very clear um, that uh, annexation is illegal. It runs against the Charter prohibition, uh, pro, pro, prohibiting uh, the acquisition of territory by force. And it's against the, the on making permanent changes in the status of occupied uh, and the right of Palestinians to self-determination. So that's there. I mean, um, Nikolai Mladenov has been in the Security Council last uh, over a week ago, and he laid out a position quite clear. Uh, any potential annexation of parts of the West Bank is enshrined in international law and Security Council resolutions. And you know, we know that um, although the internal Israeli political constraints on annexation have been resolved, as was mentioned. The, there is a, a, a government now. It's still uncertain when and how the new Israeli government will pursue this measure. And I think it's also uncertain how the, the territorial scope of annexation, um, I think that it could actually differ quite a lot from what the US Trump plan is all about. We've been trying to map out what we think the affected communities are and what the impact would be on those affected communities. But however, and despite all of these uncertainties, I think the UN feels a sense of real urgency to influence the, the whatever traje trajectory this takes. I think a wait and see policy is not something we can, a wait and see approach is not something we can do. Um, I think words are not enough in this situation. As history has shown us, once concrete steps are taken in the Palestinian context on the ground, it becomes too late to reverse the impact of that. And so the, the UN messages are, I think, are twofold. On the political front, the, as I said, Nikolai Mladenov has outlined a political position in the Security Council. And in the humanitarian space, I, I'm the humanitarian coordinator, so I'm going to focus a bit on that as well. Um, and the impact of the annexation and what the ramifications would be uh, on operations, humanitarian operations and possible funding. Um, I think there, there are existential questions around some of this. I mean, the political position is that, um, you know, annexation of the West Bank was focused as part of his briefing um, a week and a half ago. He told the council that um, the vision is clear. If implemented, the annexation of any territory in the West Bank would be a serious breach of international law and would have disastrous implications for the viability of a two-state solution. And I think also it would also close the door on negotiations and severely undermine regional peace. And I think he further stated the move towards annexation may also trigger a host of dangerous security, economic and political consequences on the ground. And part of that would be radicalization and fueling anger and resent among people. And I think it can, we've already seen an uptick in the, the actual uh, incidents of violence in the West Bank. And I think this would ultimately do some irrep irreparable damage to Palestinian and uh, Israeli relations. Um, recently, we've heard speeches by President uh, Abbas and uh, Prime Minister Steyer about walking away from the bilateral agreements and dismantling the Oslo Accords agreements. And steps have been taken in this direction already, and uh, the impact on the ground is quite concerning. And uh, but at the same time, we see these, and we recognize these as a, as a cry for help from the international community. On the political front, the UN is focused on responding to the Palestinian call for a multilateral uh, mechanism to work out work better on the resolving the conflict. There's mention of the quartet, mention of the quartet plus. There's also a regional quartet being talked about as well. And so the UN is working behind the scenes and constantly trying to bring the parties together. We are speaking out against the initiatives and we'll try, you know, we'll try and prevent um, the division and you know, using every opportunity we can, like this one here today, to explain the potential impact of annexation and ensure that we are speaking in the same voice with all of our partners because uh, we have to get collective on this and we have to be some sort of solidarity. 
And if there's a, a, any chance of politically influencing annexation over the, the, the next few months, it's now. And it would be through talking to partners in the Arab world and elsewhere, sending a clear message to Israel on the consequences of any unilateral moves and working with everyone in the Israeli establishment, the NGO civil society, as well as in Palestine, and to explain the possible consequences for them as citizens of Israel in the future. I mean, I think, um, well, the, the legal position is clear in accession, the potential impact on the ground remains to be seen. We're trying to you know, work out the scenarios and work out what that might mean. But I mean, looking at the plan as it stands under, and although it's not defined properly, and there's a, there's a team of mapping ex experts in the US and the Israeli side trying to come up with what that looks like in a defined plan. But the way we see it right now, there's 150 Palestinian villages and hamlets. That's about 140,000 people who will be annexed uh, if the plan goes into full fruition. And I, and I want to be clear that uh, partial or full annexation will result in increased humanitarian and needs on the ground. I've already, as, 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 uh, as Sharona mentioned, some of the herding and, and families that are out, out there already. And, it will f and I think there'll be a, a real possibility of uh, further restrictions on the ability of humanitarian actors to operate in that area. And so for me, there's about six elements that I think are, are worth uh, reflecting on. Um, I think uh, there'll be an escalation in clashes and violence. Any announcement of a formal annexation of parts of the West Bank could, could trigger waves of protests and clashes between Palestinian and Israeli forces. And now there's no cooperation between the, the Israeli and Palestinian security forces, all the more likely. Additional Israeli checkpoints designed to control Palestinians' access to the newly annexed areas will immediately become friction points. We've seen it in the past. Changes to any arrangements at the Haram al-Sharif, uh, Temple Mount, uh, Al-Aqsa compound in Jerusalem, risk being particularly destabilizing. And there's a risk that uh, the settler violence against Palestinians will rise even more than it already has in the last three, four months, both in the areas that are annexed and where where settlements, settlements and settlers are expected to remain outside the annex areas in the so-called enclaves. I think much will depend on the approach adopted by the Palestinian security forces in the West Bank and by Hamas and other factions in Gaza. If one or more of these actors encourages or facilitates or instrumentalizes unrest, this may result in mass casualties as occurred during the, the embassy closure in May 2018 when the Great March returned. And this could further escalate if armed factions in Gaza react by shooting rockets into, Gaza, into Israel. I mean, a second aspect for me also, as was mentioned uh, previously by Munir, is uh, restrictions on access to services and, and workplaces, movement between Palestinian enclaves and main cities and towns located in the contiguous Palestinian areas will require passage through Israeli territory the annexed areas. Um, passage through these areas will be subject to Israeli control and we know what that looks like, and which depending on the level of tension and security assessments will most likely result in additional permanent, even sometimes clash ad hoc checkpoints, restrictions on vehicular movement, closures of main entrances, um, and uncertainty requiring long detours, preventing access by non-residents to certain areas. And I think Israeli, Israel's development of separate road systems, one for Palestinians and one for Israelis, which is already a, a scene, as witnessed over the last 20 years, could be further entrenched. A third aspect, uh, and was again mentioned by Moura, is the, the changing or the, the loss of entitlement to residency, to services and benefits. Israeli class, it classifies under law that the majority of Palestinians living in East Jerusalem as permanent residents, as, as we heard, rather than citizens. And their residency status is conditional on proving that their center of life lies within the, the Israeli-defined municipal boundary of Jerusalem. If the, the status of the municipal areas behind the barriers change, their residency sta status can be revoked by rendering them unable to access the rest of East Jerusalem. Their entitlement to services, in particular, as we know, under COVID, the health is so important, and social security allowances, which they have, have invested in through years of compulsory contributions and salary reductions, could be forfeited. The fourth aspect that we've noted is uh, the impact would be the access restrictions and expropriation of land. Palestinians access to farming and grazing lands is essential for agricultural livelihoods of farmers. The Israeli government decisions will mean that land access will be heavily restricted to Palestinians and the land would be vulnerable to expropriation as we've seen. Uh, Palestinian access to any land in the annex areas will resemble that uh, implemented for the last, past 17 years in the, the area between the Green Line and the barrier. This system will severely undermine the agricultural livelihoods of these farmers. And Palestinians also risk losing the land through the application of an Ottoman period land law or the 1950 absentee property law. 
And these are main methods that Israel has used to acquire land, including for Israel's, Israeli settlements, uh, Palestinian uh, Bedouin and herders communities who often do not possess formal titles land are especially vulnerable in this move. I think the fifth area for us is, is, is a, 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 an aspect of annexation would be constant, uh, the sort of constraints that are likely on urban development. Israeli plans for annexation could encompass most of the land reserves available for urban development of numerous Palestinian localities. I think this will se severely constrain urban development for Palestine and Palestinians. And the last aspect for us is the, the heightened force, and it was mentioned, the heightened risk of forcible transfer. As I mentioned, 150 villages, 140,000 people could fall foul within parts of the West Bank and to be annexed to Israel, excluding East Jerusalem. If any or all of these areas were to be annexed, the affected areas would become enclaves within a contiguous Israeli state, but which would, which would still be part of the state of Palestine. It's a, it's a very complicated and complex situation. I think what we have then is, is a very serious impact on the humanitarian operations. Against that backdrop I've just mentioned, as, as humanitarians, we're also concerned about the impact annexation would have on our ability to deliver to services to Palestinians within the annexed areas. UNRWA and other UN agencies are delivering schools and health clinics and water sanitation programs. Our concerns include what form of legal standing would we have to operate in these areas once annexed? What access and movement restrictions would we face? What form of engagement would we have with the authorities? And one possible scenario is, is, is that the precedent set by East Jerusalem, where Palestinian Authority, a key service provider in Area C, is totally prohibited from operating, while the operating space of the international organizations is constrained. A more serious scenario probably could be um, a blanket prohibition on all UN agencies and international organizations working inside the annex areas without explicit and proper agreement with the Israeli authorities, which is not why we're here. Um, so we're also concerned what impact annexation could have on donor funding. Will donors continue to fund the programs we have, given that they're no longer part of Palestine, but although there are Palestinians inside an annexed area? I think some of these things will, will have to be asked. We started conversations here in Jerusalem, and I'm meeting with the, the Tel Aviv donors next week, and to try and get a conversation going on what some of these are, to use it to try and amplify some messages that we're all putting out there at the moment. Our uh, UN team and the political side has continued to convey our political position to engage regionally with all the actors and to speak with the government of Israel and Palestine. Uh, we think uh, robust active engagement by donors and partners is needed now. We can't wait. And it's not only words. And I think we should uh, spell out what the potential consequences will, may well be. And uh, ultimately, any form of, of uh, annexation will worsen the lives of Palestinians and will deny people the rights and will definitely increase the humanitarian needs, which are already quite dire anyway. And I think it will risk destabilizing the Palestine OPT and the region possibly as a whole. And I think would certainly uh, put a serious dent or blow to the prospect of a negotiated solution to the Israeli-Palestine uh, conflict and that the UN, the international UN family have been supporting for many, many decades. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you very much, Jamie. Great. Um, thank you so much for the interventions by the three speakers. Um, now I would like to open up the floor for questions from the audience uh, via my colleague, uh, Dear Guillaume, who has been collecting questions. I already received a couple, but also maybe to start, a question to all the three panelists. Last Thursday, there was a parliamentary debate in the Dutch parliament and the Dutch foreign minister, Stef Bloch, was asked a number of questions about annexation by Dutch parliamentarians. And when asked about kind of what the Dutch government would do, you know, to try to prevent this, he basically said that this would kind of be speculation on an intent of the Israeli government, but not, you know, and that he'd rather act based on concrete actions. So that seems like a more kind of prudent, you know, wait and see approach. I think all of you, or at least at least two of the speakers said, you know, time for action is now. Could you say maybe more specifically what you would very much like to see the Dutch government, but broader, broader European governments do now to prevent the annexation from taking place? Um, maybe all three speakers. Munir, would you like to start? Yes, sure. And um, maybe I should start by saying that, uh, unfortunately, um, the annexation of Jerusalem, which happened back in 1967, uh, which was not only condemned by the United Nations General Assembly and the Security Council, uh, but also it was seen as absolutely illegal 
and that the results of which will be null and void, um, uh, uh, has had, has, has, has received condemnation. However, um, um, we, we also can notice that this has never uh, affected the relationship that Israel has with many of the countries of the world, including the Netherlands uh, or most of the European Union which uh, gives a lot of preferential treatment to, uh, to Israel compared to other states, a lot of aid, a lot of cooperation. Uh, so Israel is being rewarded all the time, uh, but at the same time, in some cases, uh, the states are criticizing and condemning. Uh, it would be very unfortunate if we uh, see again uh, that uh, the government of the Netherlands, um, as well as other uh, European uh, and international governments, uh, different governments in the world will do the same. Will maybe say this is wrong. Uh, we condemn it. We do not recognize it, and and stop there. Uh, if the European Union uh, and the single countries in the European Union act differently and acted differently in the past, and uh, did not uh, uh, find. Uh, that only a very small criticism was enough, if they actually acted, if they uh, put a price on, um, uh, on uh, the continuation of human rights violations uh, for Israel, um, if they actually put a price on that, uh, uh, the scene would have been very different today. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it, 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 this hasn't happened in the past. Uh, for example, uh, in the Human Rights Council, on the UN Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council issued a resolution uh, uh, only to publish the names of uh, companies that invest uh, in Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Only to publish. Not saying to sanction, not to punish, just to publish the names, right? <laughs> totally informative. The European countries were totally against it. I've been myself uh, uh, present in discussions, uh, in advocacy uh, discussions with diplomats in, in the UN in Geneva. And the diplomats, the representatives of states, were totally against it. And we're not even talking about sanctioning companies. We're just talking about publishing names. What if we you know, try to go further into, into sanctions, into actually applying law? These companies are participating in war crimes. Um, but the European Union does not care, unfortunately. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry for that. I'm not a diplomat, so I, I feel free to to say what I uh, uh, you know what I what I witness. At the end of the day, um, I'm a human rights advocate, and I believe I should be uh, honest and clear. Uh, so European countries simply don't care uh, about um, uh, have not cared so far, and I hope that this will change soon uh, about human rights violations that were taking place. Um, and they think that um, simply a couple of words are more than enough, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Munir. Uh, Sharona, would you also like to respond to this question? Yes, sure. Um, I'll try to keep it short, but I, I think, first of all, I don't think it's my place to tell the Dutch 100% what to do. Um, and also there is legislation, local legislation, that prevents me from speaking freely or suggesting any actions that could fall, be considered boycott, divestment, or sanctions. So I will start by saying, saying that, um, which can fall into the work of the shrinking space of civil society. However, I will say there are international precedents and there's an international framework that implies which actions can be taken and what responsibilities the United states are. Also, um, if there is not consensus in the EU, I do understand that there are there is possibility for bilateral actions of, that states can take. Um, I would say mostly, I think what we would see is that very clear red lines would be drawn and that the actions that should be taken, should those red lines be crossed, that that would be um, very, very clear, made clear to the Israeli government. I think this is what's been missing in the past. In the past, we hear a lot about two-state solution, um, and I think that it's at the expense of a human rights language that we really need, especially in this situation. So that's that would be my suggestion. 
answer. Thank you so much, Sharona. Uh, Jamie, would you also like to give a few thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Maria spelled out quite clearly um, the, you know, the, the challenges that are there. I mean, it's quite clear, it's quite hard to get the EU as a collective on the same page on many issues. And I think Palestine is one of those issues that fragments the political discord within the, the EU. I think member states individually are probably a better chance. And I think that there will be a move probably for like-minded states to come together and discuss what that, like, what that means. Uh, there are already, I think, legislation available for them to enact what that looks like, and I think they have to make that choice themselves. I do think that there's also a role for civil society in uh, Palestine and civil society in Israel to have a chance to have their voices uh, linked to civil society, and that should be an, an advocacy message into Europe. And sort of, As we saw, for example, what, what happened uh, with the, 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 the George Floyd and how straight away you had uh, demonstrations in Tel Aviv, demonstrations in London. I mean, the, the civil society is watching the world change. And, and I think that if you were to put, put the message together properly and use it as a life with dignity message rather than a political message, I think you could have a residence there. You know, why, why should someone in Palestine uh, annex their other wife? Why should they have a less chance of a good life than someone else? Why should their schools be different? Why should their prospects be different? Why a 25-year-old young person living in Gaza who looks at his phone in the morning and sees a, an equivalent age person in Spain or in Italy with a car and a job and a house and going to the airport to travel on holiday, and he can never do anything except just dream of that and dream in a night, night, nightmare scenario situation such as Gaza. So I, I think we have to put the human uh, aspect out there because the politics are not going to change things. Politics is about words. And the words are not going to affect change. I think what you have to do is get social messaging into a uh, discourse that takes place in civil society, link people through you, I mean, through your platform, through your organizations, you know, build that link and build that, 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 you know, what's being endangered for civilians and what's being endangered for citizens of countries. And I think that's how you do it. Um, I, I don't know what you could do to the, the Dutch parliament. There's any other parliament. You can brief them. You can explain to them the, the consequences of what's happening. And hopefully they would take action. But I, I think it's, it's not for our place nearly to do that. Meanwhile, the UN works with all the regional actors, uh, you know, both in Palestine, Gaza, West Bank, and regional and beyond, and with Israel. And just to try and sort of keep the, the ball moving, to try and get some multilateral mechanism that people want, I think to try and solve this problem rather than it being done in a very force-fed me uh, method, as is the case at the moment. Thanks. Thank you so much. Maybe some further questions. Uh, Munir, you know, you call yourself a human rights advocate. These are, of course, difficult and dire times. But I was wondering, are there also things that give you hope, that you have a sense of, you know, where you see opportunities? Yeah strange word obviously in the context but are there bright lights that you see uh, fortunately yes uh, and um, and my answer doesn't come from the fact that i work in human rights but more because i'm also an academic and i've been reading experiences of different countries that were in similar or even worse situations than uh, than in palestine uh, and have been eventually uh, liberated from that uh, um, I, I did uh, write my PhD thesis on uh, transitional justice and I looked at different places where uh, of course nowhere is perfect of course uh, even after transitional justice experiences uh, but uh, we can see that um, um, that um, uh, the, the things improve after uh, sufficient pressure after regimes, decide, regimes uh, find that uh, the continuation of uh, uh, injustices cannot be sustainable forever, um, and, uh, and then they decide to change these regimes. I believe that this will happen one day uh, in, 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 in Palestine and Israel. Uh, I don't think that we will uh, continue to live under this uh, uh, apartheid uh, uh, regime uh, forever. Uh, the severity of the injustices, um, and even when the injustices become more severe, uh, hopefully, um, are signs for um, change one day. I'm not now saying this as an academic, I'm just saying that I have hope. And this is a problem that um, I always have, even with people I work with in the human rights field. Uh, I find that some people cannot take it anymore. They work for a few years uh, and then they feel so much pressure because they meet with victims, they document their stories, 
uh, they see them cry, uh, they uh, uh, go to uh, do advocacy internationally, they speak to diplomats, uh, and they see the cold faces of diplomats who, uh, in many cases, don't sympathize uh, enough. Um, and, uh, and then after a few years, they feel that they have not moved forward. Um, and some of them decide to leave the whole field of human rights, and some of them uh, take a break from the field. And uh, uh, I, I can see that it, it actually causes psychological uh, uh, um, pressures. The way I uh, treat myself from this uh, psychological uh, pressure uh, of, of human rights uh, advocacy work is uh, by two things. First, the hope that I expressed by reading how other places in the world uh, uh, actually were liberated eventually and human rights became better. And the big picture in the world is actually much brighter than the way it looked 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So, um, you know, one day slavery was legal, right? So uh, things change, nothing stays the, the same. And then the second way I treat myself is by saying, um, well, uh, I'm not that significant if I live all my life without seeing the end of the uh, of the injustices while being believing that this will happen one day. That's okay. I don't need to see it. It's not. Uh, it shouldn't. Be, it doesn't have to be in my lifetime. So I'm I'm happy with only being an advocate, even if I don't see the results. Because in our experience in Palestine, we shout and shout and shout, and we so we see no changes uh, in. Uh, in any foreseeable future. And I, I know that and I expect it. And unfortunately, I'm saying that, but I'm, I, 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 I can live with it, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, Munir. I'm just looking down at my mobile phone and there is a question. Uh, I think I can best address this to you, Sharona. This question is, should the EU or EU countries, you know, either collectively or bilaterally apply sanctions or yeah, strong economic and diplomatic pressure on the Israeli government should it, should it indeed proceed to do the du jure annexation? How do you expect the Israeli government to respond? Will it actually respond to such uh, pressure? As for should it proceed, I can't really answer that question. As I said in my earlier response, um, I think that needs to be the decision of European states. Um, there are precedents for that, such as we saw in Korea. Um, but um, as for whether the Israeli government will react, um, I think it will. It would have pressure on the Israeli government. Um, we see, for instance, that significant diplomatic pressure succeeded in at least delaying the um, demolition and expulsion of the community of Khan al um, which is now probably under annexation, again, going to face significant risk. However, there was a, a huge diplomatic campaign and red lines were actually drawn um, by various states in a way that we hadn't seen before. I think, um, I do believe that sanctions were even mentioned was also a warning from the International Criminal Court and all of this together resulted in the government saying okay we're not going to carry this out right now. Um, it, they didn't say that they won't ever in the future but they did actually seems to have had some sort of impact and I think um, the Israeli government is not immune to international pressure as much as the rhetoric sometimes seems that they don't care but they, I think that if they know that there are these red lines and that there are actions that taken, I do think that it can deter at least certain aspects. Um, however, on the other hand, I will say that like we already see do your annexation in place and so I do think it's important to understand that we even if annexation is not announced because of the ramifications, um, there are still significant human rights violations occurring. So we don't want to forget that in, in also. Thank you. Um, and then I have one uh, final question for Jamie before it, I'd also like to give the three panelists an opportunity to make closing remarks. Jamie, uh, if indeed the annexation happens, what do you expect to happen to the official Middle East peace process? Well, I mean, I think uh, like any any situation where you change the parameters dramatically, then uh, it will have an impact on the, the peace process. 
Um, I, I don't think it, it will end the peace process. I think it will just change the dynamic. I, I think it's, it's important. That the most important thing is we, we're in a preventative mode right now. That's where we have to be. Uh, I think uh, there's no point trying to speculate what might happen on the ground or because I don't think that's helpful. I think it's more, impo more important to, to explain to people what the, the impact of it would be on people's lives. And then secondly, what the impact would be on the countries uh, bilaterally towards each other, uh, regionally and then globally. I think it could be not just, because it's not just, when it says that the, the Middle East, it's not just Palestine, and Palestine is, is one of the trigger points for it. And I think it's something that people are very conscious of. I don't think there's a, a coherent view of Palestine in this region. I think it's changed in the last two, two decades. I think in the last three or four years, there's been significant changes in the relationship between key member states in the region towards Palestine and how they view it. I think there's also a change in the way the people on the street of those countries versus uh, the, the governments of those countries view Palestine as well. So I think all of those things are out there. And I think we just have to be uh, wary of the fact that there needs to be dialogue and conversation to take place with all, all, all actors. And by closing doors, it doesn't help solve things. It just closes the door. So I, I think from our side, we are preventative, but at the same time, encouraging dialogue by offering mechanisms and opportunities for people to come back to the table, because right now we're so far away from the table, it's just not helpful. Thank you so much, Jamie. And uh, I said it was my last question, but I'm seeing some more questions coming in. And uh, one of the, um, the participants is asking, um, yeah, a number of things have been raised of potential, you know, measures that European governments to take to try to prevent uh, annexation of all the different diplomatic steps that uh, EU member states could take. Um, which one do you think would have really the most impact and could be the most successful to prevent an annexation? Do you think any thoughts to share with us on this? I, I would say uh, uh, change their view uh, concerning the uh, UN database for um, uh, for businesses investing in settlements um, and uh, start cooperating positively uh, with that UN mechanism. Uh, I mean, of course, there are a million things, but since, you know, we're asked to prioritize and uh, so I decided to prioritize. This is priority number one, in my opinion, one, one important priority. Why did I choose this one? Because it's a mechanism that is available now to us and it's a UN mechanism. So it has the legitimacy of the UN. I'm not asking people to do any uh, crazy things. You know, it's a UN mechanism that is available for us right now. So start interacting positively. Uh, stop fighting uh, this mechanism and uh, um, and 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 uh, and interact with it. Uh, the second one uh, that I would say is to change uh, the uh, to work on changing the positions of EU countries concerning the International Criminal Court. Uh, in general, most UN uh, EU countries have been uh, against uh, the Palestinian. Uh, uh, joining uh, accession to the Rome Statute and to the jurisdiction of uh, uh, the International Criminal Court on Palestinian Territory, uh, despite uh, all of the um, uh, potential protection that we might seek through that court. Uh, so I would say that too. Um, these would be the main two points that I would ask as really immediate things that should happen, although I'm not optimistic. Thank you, Munir. Um, Jamie and Sharona, would you also like to comment on this? Of all the different actions that EU member states could take, what would you prioritize? You know, what, what should civil society advocate for? I would say there's a couple of things. I think civil society happy part of, of the conversation with the, their, their governments. I think we also have to get, you know, the EU um, within there coming up. What is the some search for common ground on how they view this? Uh, it's quite fragmented along lines that we've already seen, and for easier things and annexation to to look at. But I also think within governments themselves, I think that there's a need for different parts of them, different departments and ministries to talk to each other. I mean, you have a trade ministry, you have a foreign affairs ministry, you have a political ministry, you have an investment ministry, and, and they all view uh, Palestine and Israel differently. 
And I think it would be important if you had them to have a conversation. I think also here in this uh, Palestinian context, you have member states who have, um, they have ambassadors in Tel Aviv and the same government has uh, consul generals in Ramallah or Jerusalem, and then you have the capital. So trying to get those three locations on the one page on these issues is also an effort, I think, that has to be invested in. And I think that the, the way that you'll get them on the page is the, the human dimension. I don't think you'll get it on the page on, a, on a, a, sort of a political dimension, possibly on a human rights dimension, because we've seen it in Kandal Akmar as a, a sort of an iconic opportunity, but there are not many like that. and There's not many success stories like that. So I, I would just say that you'd have to start thinking uh, advocacy through human dimension and get it to civil society and in parallel get conversations with governments. What is the impact of the trade and the investment? What's the impact of the political decision? What's the impact of the silence? I don't know. All of those things have to be put on the table. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Sharona, I don't know if you would also still like to comment, uh, please. And also if you would like to share any, you know, final remarks and thoughts with the audience members. Sure. Um, I think my colleagues, I mean, they covered it pretty well. I mean, I would emphasize also that um, the UN list that Munir refers to will become actually much larger should annexation take place. Um, it'll become almost impossible to apply differentiation. And I think that this is something that should be raised, um, that you that should raise with the Israeli authorities is the danger of not being able to apply differentiation, which could actually lend weight to those who um, try to suggest uh, actually boycotting all of Israeli, Israeli products. Um, I also, as far as um, closing remarks, I would suggest uh, that people just continue to educate themselves. I also um, just, I think that if people can continue um, to emphasize human rights language as well in their dealings with the Israeli government, I think that it's vital. It's not enough um, human rights language being applied. There's also, um, I think that we need to um, be more creative in the solutions that we're, we're arriving at, um, and not only be stressing the two-state solution, which I, Yes, Dean, we don't take a position on two state versus one state, but we believe it's extremely important that there's a human rights um, based approach applied. So. Thank you so much. Munir, do you have any final thoughts for the audience members? Uh, yes, my, my closing remark would be, um, I do not think that we can prevent uh, the annexation soon. So um, this is not what we should really worry about, although of course, if we could prevent it, that we will be wonderful, but I do not see this happening, especially that uh, uh, Israel is supported by the uh, US uh, Trump administration uh, in what it's going to do in the annexation. Um, uh, Trump even expressed this as part of his peace plan. Um, so uh, it's very unlikely that Israel will uh, not take this opportunity. But, you know, um, the annexation is not something sudden. It Oops, Munir, I think your screen uh, just froze. Uh, Munir, if you could just ah, start... No problem. If you could just repeat, starting from where you said uh, annexation is not something sudden, I think you said. Yes, yes. It's not something sudden. And Israel uh, for decades. Uh, it's not something that we, uh, uh, we can pretend to be shocked about today, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, uh, this is the pattern. The pattern is that things continue. Uh, what will be after annexation may be some sort of a disengagement from some areas in the occupied territory, uh, uh, creating more controlled Bantu stands, something similar to what, how Gaza looks like today, uh, more looking, having the same in the West Bank. We can expect this in a few years from now, I think, not, not immediately, I believe. Um, so uh, we, know, we, know, we know where we are going in a way. Uh, and this dream of the uh, peace process uh, succeeding uh, is certainly now um, unrealistic uh, at, at this stage. 
Uh, and that's why um, I, I would I would really recommend to um, uh, not to focus only on one event, but to look at the big picture um, and to do um, uh, for the, whoever is interested to engage in continuous uh, uh, advocacy uh, and to try to uh, support the measures that are uh, available uh, for support. Where nobody is saying wage wars or anything like that. We're just saying. There is a human rights framework and an international law framework that is provided. Uh, 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 I would invite people to um, um, to support that at least. Thank you very much. Thank you for those words, uh, Jamie. Would you like to share any closing remarks from your side? Yeah, I just think that you know that there's a, the humanitarian dynamic of it is very, very uh, worrying. I think member states in the EU, you know, they have to look at the sort of the way that they intend to fund and continue to fund. Uh, are they going to turn a blind eye to some of the stuff that goes on, or just go ahead in business as usual? Uh, I think they have to get their their messages a bit more consistent. I think uh, having some sort of broad policy review, you know, looking at the you know the implications of what annexation might mean for them. And, uh, and obviously what the relations would be with Israel because of that, I think those would have to be some of the things that we'd look at um, moving forward. I do think we have to encourage uh, regional actors to be much more engaged and much more consistent and uh, much more forward leaning on this one. And I think that uh, also uh, civil society as well, there has to be connectivity between those there. I think we should all stop looking back uh, with fondness and nostalgia. And I think we sort of, look forward to, sort of, as mentioned by Sharona, there's a lot of international norms and EU's own laws and the government's own laws um, can fit into whatever happens with annexation and, and after annexation. And I just think a self-reflection is, is something we should start thinking about doing just now. I, I don't think scenario planning and worst case, the best case scenarios is, is very important. I think it's what will happen, and uh, if, if it does happen, we have it. It'll have an impact on us. More importantly, we can't reverse it. And so I think it's important that we prevent and uh, we're prepared to take action beyond just words to prevent that from happening. Thanks. Thank you so much. That's very clear. Um, I see that at the height of our webinar, we had about uh, we had 35 participants, but we see that participants are dropping now. So I do want to wrap up. Uh, however, before doing so, I just wanted to share one message from one of the participants to you, Munir, who said, and I quote, um, your remark on timelines clearly frames how difficult it is to foresee how the situation will develop while you keep hope to be able to live and see a positive change. Thank you for sharing that. I thought this was a nice message I just wanted to convey to you. I want to thank all three panelists for taking the time to speak to us. I presume that most uh, participants are from the Netherlands, but probably also some from other countries. I do want to very clear that this is just the first of two webinars and that on the 16th of June there will be a second webinar focused on the settlement economy. There we will have Maha Abdullah from the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies, Mr. David Kuttenberg, a Canadian educator, journalist and activist, and finally also Sadat Karabulu, who is a Dutch member of parliament for the Socialist Party. I do very much hope that uh, some of the audience members joining today will join again then. Of course, as I said, this is the being recorded so the four participant the four organizing organizations will also share this webinar via our social media channels and on our website um, and yeah thank you once again for uh, um, Munir, Sharona and uh, Jamie for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, thank you and for your commitment to the cause and uh, yeah thank you very much thanks to you thank you all the bye all the best bye bye bye